It's my privilege to present to you my defense on understanding, predicting, and improving immune checkpoint blockade immunotherapy response in bladder cancer. Here's an outline for my defense today. First, I'll give you some background on bladder cancer. In the first section of my results for my thesis, I'll tell you about predicting immune checkpoint block B immunotherapy response. In the second part, I will talk about tumor spatial architecture and its impact on response to neoadjuvant chemo immunotherapy, followed by a further discussion of correlates of chemo immunotherapy response. In the fourth section of the presentation, I'll present to you on some preliminary work on neoantigen vaccination paired with continuous staff treatment. And finally, we'll have time, plenty of time, for questions and answers as well as acknowledgments. To start off, here's a brief background on bladder cancer. It's one of the more common cancers in the United States, with over 80,000 new cases per year. The average age of diagnosis is 73 years old, and it's about three times more common in men than in women. The number one cause of bladder cancer is tobacco use, which is associated with about two thirds of bladder cancer. When patients are diagnosed with bladder cancer, one of the most important things to assess for prognosis is the stage of bladder cancer. And there are three main types. There is non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer and then um, the subset of patients who have metastatic disease. The five-year survival is really pretty good for non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, which is the majority of the disease, around 70 percent of cases, and has about a 96 percent five-year survival. Muscle invasive bladder cancer has worse survival, around 50 percent, and this is about a quarter of cases. And in the small subset of patients who are initially diagnosed with metastatic bladder cancer, there is only around an 8% bladder survival rate. So we need better treatments for all bladder cancer patients. There's especially a dire need of better treatments for patients who have advanced disease. Here's a timeline of bladder cancer therapies. For much of the history of bladder cancer treatment, up until the 2010s, the major modality of treatment um, for advanced disease was chemotherapies. And here are the approvals of chemotherapies by the FDA from 1970 up to 2010. But since 2010, there's been a slew of new treatments that have come out. Many of these are immunotherapies. And the type that I'm going to talk about in particular today is outlined in red there. These are immune checkpoint blockade immunotherapies. This is a little bit about immune checkpoint blockade and how it works. The immune system, to prevent from being overactivated in cases such as an infection, has a system of breaks, and these are called immune checkpoints. So T cells will interact with other T cells and other immune cells, and to prevent autoimmunity and reaction against the cell, there are these molecules called immune checkpoints, which are receptors and ligands on different immune cells. Two of the classic ones are shown here, which are PDL1 and PD1. But cancer cells co opt the system of breaks to inhibit T cells, which can prevent them from killing the cancer. And what immune checkpoint blockade does is it blocks those breaks to uninhibit the T cells so that they can be activated to kill the cancer. Immune checkpoint blockade has worked pretty well for advanced bladder cancer. This is the data from the Keynote 045 trial uh, for metastatic urethelial carcinoma. Urethelial carcinoma and bladder cancer, I'm going to talk about both a little bit today, but the overlap is pretty high. Around 90% of urethelial carcinomas are bladder cancer, and bladder cancer is about 90% urethelial carcinoma. So here we see a boost in survival with pembrolizumab treatment. Pembrolizumab is a common immune checkpoint blockade drug versus chemotherapy, standard of care. However, only about 20% of the patients who are receiving pembrolizumab actually have their tumors shrink, which is a sign that um, they would go on to have 
better survival. So this drug is working in a subset of patients, but what we need to do is figure out, first of all, if we can predict which patients will respond to the drug, because we don't want to treat patients who won't respond and risk severe adverse effects. We also want to be able to build on and improve um, response to immune checkpoint blockade immunotherapy. For the first part of my presentation, I'm going to talk about predicting ICD response. And for this part of my defense, I want to especially thank these members of the UC Genome Project team for their help. UC Genome is a project that was supported by the Bladder Cancer Advocacy Network. This is a group uh, that supports bladder cancer awareness and life-saving research to improve outcomes with the disease. For UC Genome, in this project group, it was uh, looking at data from many different clinical trials around the country of immune checkpoint blockade immunotherapy and looking at outcomes with um, metastatic urethelial carcinoma. So the other purpose of this trial was to develop, uh, to sequence patients' tumors and uh, learn from that sequencing data and to develop a biobank repository of specimens so in the future we can build on that research and learn about metastatic urethelial carcinoma. There were 218 patients who were enrolled as part of UC Genome. What I'm going to talk about next is our reasoning behind the different things that we look at, the different features to try to predict which patients will respond to new checkpoint blockade. This is a diagram here of the tumor microenvironment because inside the tumor, it isn't all cancer cells. It's actually a complex environment with networks of cancer cells as well as stroma cells, and quite importantly for immunotherapy, a lot of immune cells. So what we wanted to do is look at RNA sequencing data, the expression of different genes, put these into gene signatures that are associated with different immune populations and immune features, and figure out if these different immune features can predict response to immune checkpoint blockade along with clinical and mutation data. Once we have the features that we wanted to look at, a list of around 60 immune gene signatures as well as clinical data, we use elastic net regression modeling to try to predict response. And how this works, if you put in a lot of variables, there might be some that aren't actually important in predicting response, but there might be some that are really important. And elastic net helps you filter the features and figure out what the relative importance of them are in uh, predicting response. So we use elastic net regression and capture the features that were important for predicting response and we're able to figure out their association with the response variable, response to gene checkpoint blockade. This is our final elastic net model showing the features and the length of the bar shows how important they are for response. The ones in red mean higher levels of them were associated with better response and the ones in black means that um, lower levels were associated with better response. So one of the variables here that's that's most important for predicting response is called TMD, that's tumor mutational burden. So having a lot of mutations means that the tumors are more likely to respond. Two of the other top ones are ECOG, which is patient performance status. So if a patient is performing well, uh, then they're more likely to respond to new checkpoint blockade. And a third one is M1 macrophage signature. These are inflammatory macrophages, the type of immune cells in the microenvironment associated with better response. In the end, our model predicted response very well on two data sets and decently on the third. So we looked at a bigger 210 uh, immune checkpoint blockade therapy data set of urethelial carcinoma, as well as a data set from UNC and the UC genome data set. And from Invader 210 and UNC, the performance was really strong, meaning that that curve is very steep, the black and light blue. And then the red curve there is for the UC genome data set. Another way to think about this, quite approximately, is that the model was around 80% accurate in predicting response to each checkpoint blockade. For the next part of my defense, I'm going to discuss response to neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. One way that we can improve outcomes and improve 
true response in patients who have muscle invasive bladder cancer is by treating early and combining treatments. Neoadjuvant means treatment before the patient will have surgery, cystectomy in this case, to have their bladder removed. And if you treat first with combination chemotherapy and immune checkpoint blockade, then you can improve long-term outcomes. Just after diagnosis, the patient will have imaging to look at the bladder tumor, and then a procedure called transcerebral resection of the bladder tumor. This means that a urologist will go in with a scope and actually scrape away and remove as much of the tumor as possible. After this, there can be a period of weeks before the patient has the cystectomy to actually remove the bladder. And in the meantime, a pathologist is looking at uh, slides of the tumor to figure out how far it's invading into the muscle wall and looking at different characteristics of the tumor. But in this meantime, the patient can be treated with drugs such as chemotherapy and immune checkpoint blockade. What we wanted to see is which features could predict initially which patients would go on to have uh, a complete response where the tumor didn't grow back between the TRPT and the cystectomy, or if the tumor stayed stable, or if the tumor increased in size. The first step that I'm going to talk about is digital spatial profiling of the tumor. We want to know if, if marker levels in different parts of the tumor had a different impact on response to treatment. We use the NanoStream GeoMX digital spatial profiling platform. And then we compared the levels of different markers and the end result as a second. Did the tumor shrink or stay stable, or did it continue to grow? Special thanks to these members of the Digital Spatial Profiling Project team for their help with this part of my thesis. I'm going to explain to you how we went about looking at the spatial architecture, how different markers were arranged inside the tumor. This here is a slide showing a bladder tumor. And there's some areas of the tumor that have a lot of tumor cells in them, tumor enriched. Other areas that have higher levels of immune cells. And then the third is the interface, where those islands of immune and tumor cells meet each other. And we looked at the, the importance of markers in these different regions of the tumor in predicting response. First step that we did is we masked we selected just the area inside these circles, the regions of interest, that were high in these different cell types. Then we looked at a panel of 52 different protein markers in the, uh, we looked at the different levels of protein markers in the masked areas and associated them with the regions of interest. To figure out what the importance of tumor architecture might be in predicting neoadjuvant chemo ICD response, we looked at three different model types and compared them. So the first one is the ROI inclusive model. This is where we have correctly paired the type of marker and also which region it came from. The second type that we compared was a randomized control model where we had completely scrambled the region that the marker came from and the type of marker. And the last one is ROI agnostic, where we took averages. And it's important that we look at all of these different um, model types to see how well our first model, the ROI inclusive model, is really performing and whether the tumor architecture is actually important. Because we want to have the same number of features in the model with the randomized model, and then also look at the average, which is more similar to what people do with bulk sequencing. Um, where you look at an average across a slice of tumor. We found that the model with the real ROI inclusive tumor architecture had the best, had the best um, response curve in that it could predict response significantly better than the randomized and the ROI agnostic models. But the sequencing platform, the digital spatial profiling, is expensive. And it's also hard to do in many different facilities because they don't have the technology for it. We wanted something that was lightweight, not as expensive, a model that could be condensed and compatible with current platforms. 
So we performed a lasso model. This is one that just selects the, the few of least most important features. And in our lasso model, we only had nine features out of the 208 that came up as uh, predictive of response. This lasso model, you see the red curve up at the top, that's the full elastic net model. But even with just nine features, it still predicted response fairly well. And it also was predictive of survival, where in the black curve, this is if they were predicted to respond, and the red curve is predicted not responders. So this is something that could be really helpful in the future for immunofluorescent or immunohistochemistry chemistry staining, where you could just take a few slides of a bladder cancer tumor, and for not as much money as the digital spatial profiling, you could get a fairly strong result it might be something that's followed up with AI in the future. Start with the digital spatial profiling um, and then select just a few markers that you're going to see in the future to be able to predict response. For the third part of my defense, I'm going to talk about further correlates of chemo ICD response, such links to these members of the LCCC 1520 uh, correlative analysis team. Let's go back to the schematic of what happens between diagnosis and suspected with new adjuvant treatment. One thing that we wanted to do is look at more different types of variables that can predict response to chemo ICD. And one of the ones we were very interested in is peripheral blood plasma analytes. So this is patients would have blood draw at the beginning of each of four cycles of treatment. And we wanted to see if looking at the different concentrations of analyte small things in the blood, if we could predict response to treatment. We looked at the concentration of a couple dozen plasma analytes and found that there was one of them that was significantly associated with response, comparing the change between cycle one and cycle two. So this is in the first few weeks of treatment. If IL-9, a uh, pleiotropic cytokine, so it stimulates many different immune cells, if levels of this IL-9 go up, then a patient is more likely to respond. And if the levels go down over that first cycle of treatment, they're more likely not to respond. So in the first few weeks of treatment, we figure out whether a patient as a second would have a response to treatment. This here is just showing the association between the change in IL-9 and response to treatment. We also looked at tumor samples from the TRBT, just as we did before, but here we're looking at DNA and RNA from the tumor samples. And we calculated, again, different immune gene signatures and saw that uh, the IL-8 signature, as well as the subtype of the tumor, were associated with better response to the combination of chemotherapy and immune checkpoint blockade versus another data set where the patients only received immune checkpoint blockade. So this is two variables that are associated with a bump in response when you add in chemotherapy to the treatment. Higher levels of this IL-8 signature, which is typically thought of as an immunosuppressive signature that is associated with cells such as myeloid-derived suppressor cells, are associated with better response when you have chemo added to the regimen. We also saw that higher levels or the presence of stroma-rich subtype, having a lot of those stromal cells in the tumor microenvironment is associated with better response. And these two things are kind of puzzling. We need to look into this further and figure out what the mechanism might be here. But one possible hypothesis is that the chemotherapy is inducing changes in the tumor microenvironment where it's leading to reduction of suppressive cells. And we need to have more data and do further analysis, particularly in in vivo models, to see if this might be the case. If chemotherapy is reducing the things that are inhibiting response to the checkpoint blockade and we need a better response as we have the combination. For the fourth part of my defense, I'm gonna talk about preliminary work we've done on new antigen vaccination. Special thanks to these members of the Kim and Vincent Labs for all their arduous work and help with this project. 
First I'm going to tell you a little bit about antigen presentation. Listen up, this part's important for the rest of the talk. So, in a normal bladder cell, there are ways that the cell tells the immune cells around it that it is normal and healthy and that they shouldn't attack it. So in the, this normal bladder cell here, DNA will get transcribed into RNA and carry it outside the nucleus of the cell and then translated at a ribosome into proteins, which are important functional units inside the cell. But for the next step, some of these proteins get degraded by proteasomes inside the cell into these small peptide chains, which they have presented on the outside of the cell and recognized by immune cells like T cells. So when T cells recognize a normal sequence, they don't react strongly because they recognize it as a self antigen. So the normal bladder cells are telling the T cells, don't kill me, I'm normal. But in the bladder cancer cell, there are many mutations in the DNA, and these mutations can get propagated through RNA, through the protein level, and be included in these short peptides that get presented to T cells. And now these T cells can recognize these neo antigens or cancer antigens. T cells can respond by releasing cytotoxic granules that go into the cancer cells and kill them. This can then stimulate uh, with the death of the cancer cells and the release of more of these neo antigens into the tumor microenvironment. It can stimulate other uh, immune cells to take up the new antigens, present them to more T cells, and build a huge response against the cancer. Cancer cells, because they have many mutations, they can present many different types of new antigens, which can get recognized by different T cells specific for the new antigens being presented on the surface. Our idea with vaccination, number one, we want to increase the immune response against the cancer. Before vaccination, the T cells that are specific for the cancer might be few and far between, but with vaccination, we want to boost, increase the number of T cells um, through replication to be able to kill the cancer and also to increase the activation of those T cells against the cancer. New engine vaccination has already made it to clinic. So this is a recent trial, Keynote 942, on high-risk melanoma where there was a, an mRNA vaccine, a neoantigen vaccine, plus pembrolizumab, and it was compared to pembrolizumab, the immune checkpoint blockade alone. And you'll see that while it's not significant, there's a trend towards increased survival when you add in a vaccine on top of the immune checkpoint blockade. This is promising, but also for high-risk melanoma, there's a much higher response to immune checkpoint blockade than what we see in bladder cancer. So we want to see if we can further improve immune checkpoint blockade for advanced bladder cancer by pairing with new antigen vaccination and a slight twist on the strategy, adding in intense fat. Let's go back to the schematic of this healthy T cell response against the cancer. Well, cancer has some tricks up its sleeve. One of them is by reducing gene expression of that original mutated bit of DNA. If there isn't any new antigen that's being produced, then that T cell no longer has a new antigen to recognize that's being presented. Therefore, no killing of the cancer cell. So what we want to do with this drug Intinisac, which is called an HAC inhibitor, it causes ubiquitous expression of some downregulated genes um, through changing around the way that DNA is wrapped around histone. So Intinistat increases gene expression. And we want to see if Intinistat could boost new antigen vaccine response by increasing the expression of those new antigens and preventing the cancer from hiding them. We've already seen that in one of our mouse bladder cancer models called BBM963, combining immune checkpoint blockade, the immunotherapy, with Intinistat leads to better responses in tumors and significantly better tumor volume reduction. This is mediated by new antigens, where they're an important part of the process. Um, 
the increased expression of new antigens leading to better response when you have intensive plus anti-P4. I'm going to tell you next about why I think that BBM963 is also a good model for us to learn more about how to design better new antigen vaccines. First, we need to talk a little bit about the types of mutations that are in bladder cancer. And one important carcinogen for bladder cancer that can cause those mutations is nitrosamine carcinogens. These are derived from nicotine, which is a natural insecticide inside of tobacco leaves. As tobacco cures, nicotine can convert into nitrosamines. These carcinogens are found in tobacco products such as cigarettes, chewing tobacco, and also in vape pens. The BBN963 cell line, you might notice BBN is a nitrosamine, n butyl and hydroxybutyl nitrosamine, which is a nicotine derivative. We get this in drinking water to mice, and after four to six months, they develop bladder tumors. We'll harvest those tumors, we grow them in a petri dish to immortalize them into a cancer cell line, and then once you have this, these cells derived from an individual mouse tumor, you can inject the same cells into many different mice. They all have the exact same kind of cancer. And after four weeks, their tumors will have grown to a big enough size where they're ready for treatment. What we wanted to do is figure out which new antigens we predict might be present in the tumors so we know which ones we could include in a vaccine. We used the Lens platform, uh, spearheaded by Stephen Vesco from the Vincent Lab, to predict which new antigens are present in those cancer cells based on the DNA and the RNA from BBM963. We saw that when you treat in a petri dish, you treat these cells with intensac, you get upregulation of many of these new antigens. So they're a lot higher expressed. So we selected this quadrant here, which is highly expressed new antigens. We also saw that when you, when you inject these BBM963 tumor cells into the mouse and you treat with intensac, that some of the new antigens disappear at the DNA level. They're, and we think that this might be due to a process called immunoediting, where the immune system specifically um, target cells that have high levels of, of these new antigens. But we looked at different bioinformatic criteria, basically calculated what we thought our best bet was for a new antigen that would work well in a vaccine. And we came across this new engine called HAS2, which I'm going to talk about for the rest of this defense. We designed new antigen vaccines that include that short protein that has two new antigen, as well as a substance called CPG, which is an adjuvant, something to boost the immune response to the vaccine. In the first pilot experiment that we did, we looked for splenocyte responses against HAS2. What this means, we looked at um, immune cells from the spleen to see if they were recognizing reacting to the HAS2 new antigen after you vaccinated. And we saw that when you took mice that didn't even have a tumor in them and gave them new antigen vaccine of HAS2, there were responses in most of the mice to this HAS2 new antigen. We also saw that when you gave a mouse a tumor and then also treated with intinisat and the new antigen vaccine, intinisat to increase the expression of many different genes, including HAS2, and then vaccinated. That in these mice, many of them also had responses against the HAS2 U engine. So with this technical work out of the way, we have some idea that it's possible to see responses against HAS2 regardless of if you have if the mouse has a tumor. In the second pilot experiment, we looked at the effects of adding that intensac into a treatment regimen with the vaccine. We vaccinated one group of tumor bearing mice, and in the other group, we also included the intensac treatment. What we saw with tumor growth is that including intensac in the treatment regimen led to 
most of the mice having their tumors completely go away, versus if you just had the vaccination, then most of the tumors grew a little bit. We also saw that a specific population of T cells, they're called central memory T cells, which might be especially important for that antigen-driven response, increase in the blood over the weeks after starting treatment with intunisac. So moving on to our third and final experiment that we've done in these pilot studies, we wanted to look at the effects of treatment on tumor response and figure out exactly what might be leading to those responses. So we compared mice that were either untreated or with different combinations of intunisac or in the vaccine, including that adjuvant CPG and or the has to predicted neoantigen. We vaccinated mice at weeks four and six and also started intense at treatment then. And what we saw is that three different groups didn't have a strong response to um, after the initiation of treatment. That controlled the unvaccinated, um, untreated group, as well as just vaccinating with the, the adjuvant to stimulate immune cells didn't really cause any response um, or with the full vaccine. The group that had intensat treatment, as we saw before in the JCI paper, is that intensat led to some leveling off of that growth curve. You'll see that in pink. But then the groups in orange and in purple that had the combination of intensat plus some sort of vaccination had the best response, with so slightly better response, and also more complete responders in the group that had the full thing, intensat plus adjuvant plus that peptide that has to predict it new antigen. Now, this tells us that the combination in tinistat and CPG adjuvant plus the vaccination with the, that has to new antigen can lead to complete responses in the tumor. But further research will need to be done to look at how this is working. What is the, the functional readout in the T cells? Is there strong specificity? Do the T cells um, after vaccination with the peptide actually respond more to that has to be antigen. How are all these pieces fitting together? Is intinistat really driving a response against um, that has to be antigen, or is it just the peptide stimulation in general is causing a general new response that can lead to responses of the tumor? I think that the most important thing that has come out of this work on new antigen vaccination is BBM963, is that we might be able to learn from this mouse cancer model how to improve vaccines. One thing is with immunogenicity prediction, we want to get better at figuring out which new antigens to put into the vaccine based on different bioinformatic criteria of those new antigens, and maybe some wet lab assays as well. And we want to look into new types of antigens not just ones that are based on one small mutation, but maybe on bigger structural changes and um, epigenetic changes that happen in cancer cells. We also saw a strong adjuvant effect. I think it's important to note that that CPG adjuvant alone led to significantly better responses in the tumors than just having the intensat. And that boost that you get from the adjuvant might be something that's seen in clinical trials as well. It might be that when a vaccine is given, it's not really that the responses improved because of the very expensive calculated and produced neoantigens that have been put in the vaccine, but it might just be that they're generally stimulating the immune system more. That's leading to better survival. And the final thing is we want to know which criteria to use for assessing efficacy of vaccines. And I thought about this a lot, and I think there are many different types of assays that really need to be done before we know that the vaccine is working how we think it is, including looking at new antigen specific immunity, but things like looking at a cancer cell and knocking out the new antigen and seeing if that affects response or seeing if it's necessary and sufficient for a response against um, the new antigen vaccine. In summary, I told you about predictors of bladder cancer ICD response, and we found that tumor mutational burden, EPOB performance status, storage subtype, and macrophage and B cell signatures, these are all things that are important predictors for response. For neoadjuvant chemo ICD, 
Assessing the spatial architecture can improve response prediction. Response is associated with increasing levels of the IL-9 plasma antibody, the peripheral blood, and there's a greater response benefit when you add chemotherapy into the regimen in IL-8 high and stromal-rich tumors. Finally, new antigen vaccines, and in particular, our new antigen vaccine model in mice could help us to learn how to make better vaccines and also to assess combination therapy efficacy. Thank you, everyone. And now we have some time for questions. <laughs>